So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session on uh, ransom awareness readiness, ransom aware readiness for that matter. Ransom means just something else, so pardon me for that. Uh, while it is to some extent a threat to your information security, though. So, we have with us uh, Devika uh, Subaya, who is a seasoned GRC professional, and Devika, with an experience of more than a decade, uh, is basically a specialist in information security management, risk management, IT compliance, internal control framework, governance, incident management, and change management. It took me a long breath to say all of that. So that's just what it is. Uh, clearly, she is a lead auditor and a Six Sigma green belt, and also something very interesting, which I don't know. It says ITIL4 Foundation certified. So maybe that's something we would like to know what it is all about. So Devika, having been part of both, you know, the service industry and the product companies, uh, it actually gives her that edge to kind of understand or comprehend the significance of both, you know, quality and agility for that matter, ladies and gentlemen. So on that note, uh, Devika is currently the BSO, which is basically Business Information Security Officer for a leading India fintech company. And she clearly enjoys writing a lot, which is very good, and uh, raising awareness about information security, and clearly believes that the education to this is the only key, you know, to kind of avoid the risk or to keep the cyberspace safer. So on that note, uh, over to you, Devika. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashish, for that introduction. <laughs> right. Hi everyone, thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, as rightly introduced by Ashish, I'm not going to add any, uh, anything up there about my introduction. So let's start the topic, okay, ransom aware readiness. It is not ransomware, it is ransom aware because the best defense against malware is definitely knowledge. If you don't know what is ransomware, then you cannot be defending against that, right? And that is very important that being an internal audit, you understand the basics of ransomware. I think a lot of people are not really interested to learn about it. The reason being that they think it's information security who should be uh, taking in charge of that. Why should I bother? Right, but it's not like that. You know, everyone has responsibility in uh, information security. It's not just a team, but it's a shared responsibility model with where everyone in the organization has a part to play. All right, let's start. Where do I have to? Uh... Okay. So, what is in the plate? Well, we are going to talk about introduction about a ransomware, then, you know, we're going to talk about the implications of ransomware. We're going to be uh, talking about the various attack surfaces, the various methodology, how ransomware attack can be done, and what is your role, which is very, very important. Okay? So what is ransomware? Now, I'm not going to give you a big definition of what is ransomware. I'll give you a very simple one. Ransomware basically is a malware, that is a malicious software, which uh, encrypts the data of any organization and then tells you that you give me money and then I'll give you your data. Right? It is as simple as that. What happens is system gets infected, the data is encrypted, and ransom is asked. Okay, so we can compare ransomware to be like cancer. Why am I comparing ransomware with cancer? Because just how cancer can be, you know, flowing in the system, in the body system and damaging your body, ransomware can just flow into the network and damage the whole network. The second thing is it can be very, very fatal, just like cancer. Okay, and there is no criteria how or which company would be infected by ransomware. You know, it's like only these companies would be infected or these will not. It's not like that. Any company, just like any people can be infected by cancer, similarly, any, anyone can be affected by cancer. Okay, and ransomware attack is basically like kidnapping. Why kidnapping and kidnapping your dear ones are, you know, taken into custody and they ask you money. Similarly, in a ransomware attack, your data is taken into custody and they are asking you money, right? Both are illegal, right? So that is why I'm comparing ransomware and with cancer and ransomware attack with kidnapping. Now, you may ask me a question, Devika, if ransomware is only about encrypting data, will not having a good backup system in place mitigate it? Why do I have to worry so much? Because if I have an offline backup, I have a good backup strategy in place, then I will tell them I'm not going to pay you any money. I have my data, 
just get out, right? That's a common thought, but that's not that easy. Why? Because ransomware is not just settled by single extortion, which is just encrypting data. Now the hackers have evolved drastically where they're going for double extortion, triple extortion, in fact, layers of extortion, okay? So in double extortion, what they do is, they not only encrypt your data, but they also exfilter your data. Okay, so what happened in ransomware, only the availability factor of the data was affected. Information security is about having the right, pers right person having the right access at the right time. So availability was hit hard on ransomware. But in double extortion, confidentiality aspect is also hit. So if you say I have backup, they'll be like, okay, you have backup, but I'll leak your data. What about that now? Right now you have to pay me a ransom. And even if you are not, you're saying, no, I will not pay you ransom even if you leak my data, what are they doing is, they are going to your clients or they're going to your supplier whose data is involved there and they're asking them for ransom. All right, so, so you know, it's not just about having your technical system in place, but also about evaluating your third party and ensuring that they have a good system in place. That is also very, very important here. 83% of successful ransomware attacks features double extortion or triple extortion. So most of it is involving these multiple layers of extortion. Okay, so what are the implications or what would happen if a ransomware attack happens? So the implications are huge, guys, but starting from financial laws, it could be regulatory implications that you may be facing, legal cost, Okay, uh, loss of trust from customers. Once you're hit, once the customer thinks that you are not capable of uh, information having information secured, they will not trust you after that, right? Your reputation is gone for a toss. Your sensitive data get exposed, which you cannot get back, right? But once confidentiality is gone, it is gone. You just cannot do anything about that. It could also have below the surface cost. That is a lot of other costs, because you know, PR, marketing, informing the people, a lot of things has to be done after that. And that is the reason it is very important that you understand about ransomware. All right, so I spoke about what is ransomware, you know, what uh, is the implications. Now let me tell you what or how can you understand about your exposure to ransomware or your company's exposure to ransomware. First thing is you have to understand your attack surface. The attack surface is the entire area that of the organization which is being exposed or uh, susceptible to hacking, all right? And then you have the vulnerability, which is the weak spots or weaknesses in the systems. All right, now attack uh, surface can be of three kind, all right? The first attack surface is digital attack surface. Now we are talking about digital resilience here. Of course, that's the first thing I would say, digital attack surface. And this is the point of vulnerability in the company's digital environment. Okay, and which the cyber criminals can basically uh, use it against you. Okay, it could be your operating systems, your applications, your cloud infrastructures, your network infrastructure, your servers, endpoints, and every devices that has been used in the company. And there could be a lot of vulnerabilities. When you have asset, assets will come with vulnerabilities also, right? So it could be weak, uh, you know, protocols. It could be having open ports in place. It could be shadow IT. What is shadow IT? Shadow IT is like, you know, using IT or information without informing IT. That is what is called shadow IT. That can also, uh, include, you know, land up in ransomware. And then un un uh, inadequate access control. You know, access control is a very important control in an information security perspective. So if all these things, are, the vulnerabilities are there, it will land up in a digital attack on you. Moving on to the next kind of uh, attack surface is the physical attack surface. We spoke about digital thing, but sometimes we don't give importance to the physical uh, devices or physical, uh, what do you say, systems that is in place. So all these, the workstation, your LAN, your routers, your data center, your IoT, printer, your backup, everything, if they get hold of it physically, that can also be exploited very badly. The first vulnerability that we have to look out for is how is the access control, the physical controls in place, you know? Physically, are people just like that able to move into your office and get hold of anything? Or is there proper physical security in place? Is there proper monitoring and surveillance in place or not? So all those things has to be checked. And if there is any vulnerability there, your physical attack surface can be exploited really bad. Uh, 
Anything, anything. Yeah, shadow IT means using the accesses or information without informing IT. You know, like your IT would have given you few permissions, but you're not letting them know that you're using, like, you know, in most of the companies, you cannot download any uh, softwares without telling the IT, right? There are detective controls in place. After you've installed, they will say, no, you've installed, please delete it, or they will delete it. But without informing them, if you're downloading, that is what is shadow IT. Sure, sure, sure. In networks, there is an aspect called protocols, having these, you know, uh, uh, what do you say? How do I say? TCP and all those things, right? So there are a few protocols which are outdated, which are not something that you're supposed to use right now. So those are weak protocols. For example, now most of the companies are using TLS version 1.2. But, uh, you know, we have come to 1.3 now. But there is some compatibility issue because of which 1.3 is not very easy to be, uh, you know, transitioned. But if, if you're still in 1.1, that is the weak protocol basically there. Yes, sir. So there is two kind of major kind of encryption. One is encryption at rest. That is the data which is encrypted when in your system, all right? And there is uh, a concept called encryption at uh, transit, in transit. So whenever it is going from one interface to another interface, like TLS 1.2 is a uh, transit at uh, data in transit protocol. So yes, it, nowadays they're ensuring that encryption is done in any state, in every state. That is very important. So I think I spoke about physical attack surface. Now the next attack surface and the most important but most neglected attack surface is the social engineering attack surface. You know what, in physical as well as digital, there were so many things that was written, right? Your IoT, this, that, this, that. But in social engineering attack surface, it is only one thing that has been attacked. And that is you and me. Okay, and I think that's the most complicated attack surface because we are very complicated. Humans are very complicated, right? You can do analysis and think well, how the devices will react. But can you really do about uh, us? It's not possible. So social engineering attack is the number of authorized users who are unprepared and who are vulnerable to any kind of attacks. All right. So it's not really a cyber attack, I would say. It is about psychology of pursuance. How a person would react at one particular uh, time. That is what is social engineering attack all about. So what happens here is uh, you're manipulated. How are you manipulated? By morality, by curiosity, by telling that you're going to get a reward if you do this thing, or you know, you, they're making you trust them, or they take you into conformity. For example, this was one example that I've been very highly giving in my company when I take uh, social engineering uh, sessions for them. You know, we have awareness session for everyone who joins the company as a part of onboarding, and I take the session for them. So, uh, you know, I asked a question that, uh, think that I am in the office, and I'm in the, you know, entrance, and I have a huge pile of book in my hand, and you're standing there, I'm not wearing an access card, you don't know me, Right? And I ask you, gentlemen, as you can see, I have so much of things in my hand. Can you help out this poor lady? Just put on the access and help me out getting in. What would you do? And most of the times, the example is not what would you do. The thing is, being a gentleman, you swipe in the card and say, please, lady. Right? Because what does it It's just a small thing, right? What is the big deal? And just swiping in the card and letting someone in. But is it that easy? Do you know if that person is trustworthy? Do you know if that person is not a hacker? Can you identify the person? So tell me something, what would you do if you are there in that place? If someone is asking you to you know, swipe in the card and let them in and you don't recognize them, they're not wearing an ID card, what would you do? Any one of you, what would you do? <laughs> but what should you do then, I, sh I will ask. Okay, you can be polite, you can say, see, uh, ma'am, I cannot swipe in my card, but can you, I can hold on your books and you can swipe in your card. You can say that, 
right? Or you can say uh, the security is standing right there, the reception is right there. You can just go there and ask them for help. They will definitely help you out. That is, sometimes you're like, this guy is so rude, right? They may think, but rudeness is not the point here. It is about security, which is very, very, very important, right? So that is how, what social engineering attack is all about. Manipulating humans to do something, making them trust, okay? That is what is social engineering all about. And it is very important that social engineering attacks are combated because having technology will not at all work here. Okay, so what, what has to be done? Let's see. So uh, before that, how social engineering attack works? So basically it has four stages of a social engineering attack. The first one is about investigation. Attacker will try to do investigation on who could be the attacker, I mean, who could be the victim here, what is the weakness the victim is having, right? If there is a person in social media who is putting up uh, wherever they are, you know, locations and all, they're tagging, that can be used. Okay, this person is on vacation. Why not just send an email stating I am from the IT team and your password is going to expire? Maybe that person will click on that link. Right? Making them stimulate or making them think. Maybe they are, it's, it's just very urgent. You get messages, right, that your credit card is going to expire. Please click on that. We often get that. But you have to ensure that it's a genuine message. Right? You have to ensure you are knowing it and you also have to inform your people that they know how to authenticate that. That is the point over here. And then, after doing investigation, they'll hook you. They will get you into a conversation, they will talk to you, and they'll make you click on that link, or make you download the malware, anything like that. Then they will play. You know, they will do the, all the things in the systems, they will wipe in the systems, they will encrypt the data, or whatever is, needs to be done as a part of the attack. And at last, they will exit without traces. Because if traces are there, then forensic analysis becomes easy. So they will try to just wipe out everything there. So these are the four stages of social engineering attack. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about what is phishing. Now in social engineering, there is a lot of way how this attack can be done, but the major one is phishing. Phishing, which is 80%, you know, it is the cause of 80% of uh, ransomware attacks and most of the attacks. Now what is phishing, which sounds very uh, similar to phishing, is basically putting a bait and making them, you know, uh, taking the control of them, basically. So the uh, person would try to engage with you and tell them and make you trust and click on some kind of a link. That is what is phishing all about. But that's not so easy also, guys, because phishing has evolved drastically. There is so many kind of phishing now. For example, you have email phishing, you have whaling, you have spear phishing, which already I think someone mentioned in the session. Where, what is spear phishing? Using a spear for phishing and targeting a fish. Similarly, you know, here a category of people or category of a function has been targeted, like the IT or the customer support, someone like that. So that is what is pure phishing. Similarly, you have image phishing. You know, there was a very interesting case that I, uh, I read uh, when I was researching about uh, cybersecurity attacks and all, where a customer support person was sent a message that I need help, okay? And then the person was trying to understand what help do you need. This person sent a screenshot the screenshot had QR code. When that click on that, okay, malware got infected. Can you really think that, you know, just clicking on an image can lead to this? But that is also happening. That is what is spear phishing. I mean, uh, image phishing over here. And why phishing is very, very, very important for us to understand and to raise awareness is that because 90% of the ransomware attack are delivered through phishing, first of all. Okay, in 2000, there was like 255 million cases of phishing. In 2022, which is 61 percentage more than 21. 61 percentage, it's a, it's a huge percentage, right? Similarly, social media is the mostly used attack surfaces. And we are all there in social media, right? If not Facebook, if not Instagram, at least LinkedIn will be there. And you know, in a company, they can block Facebook and Instagram, but they don't block LinkedIn, right? There has been attacks where a person uh, who is imposing that he's calling from another company, he's trying to recruit you, he wants, you know, he's interested in your profile, and he sends you a form to fill, and you click on that, and that's it. So it is becoming very, very complicated nowadays. Any questions on this? Because phishing is really important and it's very important that you ensure in your company the information security team is telling everyone about phishing because it could be used against anyone in the company. Okay? 
that's what it's just like fishing that is why you are like you know for fishing you're putting uh, this <laughs> Yes. So, sir, on this note, another thing is that I, you know, I've asked a lot of my audiences, like, what would you do if you get a phishing mail? You have got a mail. You can see it's not a genuine mail. You can see there's grammatical mistake. It's not coming from the correct email ID. A lot of things. What would you do? So, what would you do, sir, if you get a, if you if you detected this is a phishing mail? What would be your re reaction? <laughs> Absolutely, you should not click on the link, but when you know it's, I mean, I mean, the clicking on the link is also very, very tricky, because if you hover on it, you will come to know which address it is going to, right? And people sometimes see Amazon.com, they click on it, but Amazon.com, when you're putting the cursor, you can say it is not really Amazon.com, it is going somewhere else. So that is how you, people should be aware that you have to hover before clicking on any links. That is really, really important. Okay, and as you said, a lot of people tell me, I will delete it, I will delete it. Okay, your personal emails, if you're getting, you should delete it. Okay, fine. Yeah. There is a lot of systems like that in place, but the thing is, the email ID keeps changing every day. The domain keeps changing. Now, if you are reporting today, that will be added in the server, and next time when similar things come, they will, uh, you know, stop it. But if you start using different, different, different thing every day, it's not possible, right? The system has to detect, and then it will add it up in the, in the uh, repository. So that is the reason, it, you know, definitely system is in place, but it is not that simple. That's how they are also, we are evolving the system and they are evolving the malware. That's how it is happening, right? It's like, it's a war between us and them, right? Any other questions on this, phishing? No, two address and form address, you can see some kind of a mistakes in the spellings or something like that. So there is another aspect called CEO fraud. I don't know if you guys have heard about it, but what is happening is a lot of companies, they get an email which looks very similar to the name of their CEO, okay? Or else they get an, a, a WhatsApp messages with a profile picture of the CEO, a business account, and they try to tell these people that I'm, you know, I, I'm the CEO of the office. I need a quick help from you. Can you please uh, buy a Play Store, um, what is it called, as the uh, card for me? I will reimburse. This has happened in my past experience, in my lot of companies this has happened. So you know, similarly, they will try to trick you. The more time you take to see that message, the more probability that you'll not fall for it. But we are so busy that, you know, as soon as you get a mail, you're like, ah, yeah, I'll just click it off and finish it off, right? So when you hover on it, what happens is it will tell you where it is going, redirecting, basically. And if you feel that it's not, the name is not the same as it is saying, then you should not click on it. You should be very careful with tiny URLs. You must have seen, right, big, big URLs will be shortened. So tiny URLs are very, very difficult. You should not trust those. And also the IP addresses. A lot of places IP addresses will be put. You don't even know what is the domain name. You should not trust on all those. So that is the basic tricks that we should know and we should tell in our company also. We should ensure that in a security awareness training, these are covered. Because these, is the, these are the basic ways how phishing can be done. All right, moving, yeah. Spelling mistakes up front. I mean, why can't they just use, um, uh, you know, spell check and all those things? They will start. Their, 
but just wondering it's a very basic thing why they are currently reducing their success ratio by having so much english mistake whereas in microsoft word uh, you can simply correct that english so any idea on that basically because they are trying to send it across to a lot of audience maybe and you know they are not really working and now grammarly spell checks and all is in place so that as you said nowadays you cannot find a lot of spelling mistake but the spelling mistake cannot be uh, totally removed in the email id right because see uh, if i am the ceo of a company devika dot subaya at my, the same domain i am using all right they cannot use the same email id so some spelling mistake they have to do or maybe cake a you know instead of a they will be putting e and when you see the may, name you may not really look into it but nowadays things have become sophisticated it is not as simple and uh, as you rightly said nowadays things don't come with spelling mistakes also but there are other ways also how you can detect that for example you are getting an email which you are not uh, you know you were not expecting no my see, question my question is different huh. i'm saying we are easily detecting them right now because they are making so much for example if someone is pretending that he or she is my colleague and we know no i mean english mistake is something which is not common in india and if someone is sending me an email as one of my colleague and if english is really really bad it automatically increases our suspicion today so i was just wondering why why they are not improving their success ratio by improving their english in the body of the email so i was just trying to understand if you have you know seen that searching for keywords maybe i'm just guessing maybe it is it is to ensure that the the engines or the algorithms which is actually filtering out suspicious messages won't get it because the engines actually look for text that it can read and understand if it if 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 it doesn't understand it would most probably make it pass because it feels that okay it's not something that i don't that i don't understand and it is something that i can let go and let the user decide just a, just one way of looking at it but i think as uh, mam was mentioning it's kind of evolving i think that's one thought thank you that's the absolute point no you until unless it is mali it is done by some malicious insider you know insiders if you have malicious intent you can try it is very easy to do insider uh, these kind of things but until you have a malicious intent why will you do an uh, you know insider phishing attack i do that <laughs> but the problem is see if an external person is doing and if they get caught it is difficult for you to you know if it's a sophisticated hacker it will be difficult for you to get hold of them and do anything right if it's an insider doing it is very easy to catch it up and then penalize them so they'll be very careful about that right not to leave traces and not to leave some forensic uh, things which can be used against them and then they will lead into termination basically that is the reason right <laughs> okay sure so how to spot ransomware attack right so how to spot social engineering attack we spoke but how to spot a ransomware attack now 
First thing is watch out for known file extensions. So there are a lot of known file extension. It could be really difficult, but there are a lot of systems in place like intrusion detection systems, which will have known file extensions list. And what happens is, uh, you know, there are few uh, uh, extensions to which the encryption will happen. When encryption happens, it will change to those extensions. So the detection system can find it out. So you have to know what is the known files used in the company. Okay, in a lot of companies, they do not allow few, uh, you know, conversions. You cannot convert few file into few of the uh, extensions. So that can also prevent you from uh, becoming an attack vector there. Second thing is lo look for file rename activity, right? Renaming a file could sound very simple or maybe why, what is the big deal? I may rename a file from uh, MS Word to PP, uh, you know, PDF. What is the big deal? But when a ransomware attack happens, massive rename will happen because they will uh, change the format of all the data right they will do it will be like a huge spike so that can help you in looking out and detecting a mal uh, ransomware attack basically the third point could be create a sacrificial network share now have you heard of this term honeypot anybody knows what is a honeypot yeah Test our environment, how it is protected from external attacks. So. Self -check. Yes, yes, absolutely. So the self-check of uh, ransomware is sacrificial network share. So what happens is whenever ransomware attack happens, they will first look into the local files and then they will go for the network share. Okay, and if you're creating, and it will be alphabetic order, that is A, B, C, that's how it goes. So if you're creating a file in your local or your ne uh, network, which is like preceding the uh, sensitive ones, like E, B, name like that, what will happen is the ransomware will first go and hit those files. And you have to put up files which are old, which are slow in those places that may hit the network connectivity, but it is important that you're not getting hit by a ransomware attack, right? So when it start converting those data, the IDS will detect that there is something wrong. And before they actually get hold of the sensitive data, you can stop it. All right. The next is update your IDS system with exploit kit detection rules. Exploit kit is something that gets downloaded along with the malware. So when there is a malware spam or when there is a, you know, uh, exploited websites, you know, that is downloaded or when you click on it, exploit kits come along the way. So if you have an IDS which has updated exploit kit in place, you can detect that there is something wrong and then prevent it from, you know, exploiting the network. Next, yeah, sorry. Yes. Yes, exploit kit is a very generic term. There could be a lot of kind of exploit kit depending on the intent of the malware. What does that malware wants to do? It depends on that. But no, the generic IDS IPS system that we are having right now, they also get data from outside, right? So they keep updating the current exploit kit. So they will know that this is the exploit kit that I should not allow or, you know, depending on the reporting rates and all those aspects. Detection system. And IPS stand for intrusion prevention system. This is a part of firewall as well as there are new technologies also, software is available which is, you know, sophisticated IDS IPS is also are available in the systems. Yes, yes. Endpoint protections. Use client-based anti-ransomware agent that will do the protection in the client system right, in the laptops and all, that will protect from, from becoming an attack uh, or, you know, becoming a prey to ransomware. That can also happen. The last is watch out for slow server and system performance. Now, when, yeah. How an IDS system basically will, because those are something at a very network. IDS is not just for uh, network, it can also be for domains also, for a lot of kind of IDSs are there. In fact, uh, in Gmail itself, you know, whenever someone is reporting a website as spam or as suspicious or phishing, that goes into the database of the G Gmail and whomsoever is using Gmail, let it be business class or normal class, it will automatically mark it as phishing or mark it as spam. It will not allow that to come into your network automatically. Okay. 
And then watch out for slow server and system performance because when ransomware is hit, the system becomes very slow and you have a SOC system, mostly security operations is, uh, center in place which will monitor the network, right? And if there is something suspicious, they look into from where the uh, traffic is coming and that also can help to detect. Moving on to the next slide. All right, so that is a very important slide. Now I'm standing at the portal of internal auditors and I definitely have a talk, what is the role of internal auditors in ransom aware readiness, right? Correct, so I would first say, <laughs> which means for the non-Tamil audience that there's nothing that you do not know. Of course you know, there's no law that you do not know. It's a, it's a f movie uh, dialogue, uh, Tamilans would get that, it's a very famous one. <laughs> okay, but, but I would like to put up some words on, you know, what, how ransomware has to be dealt when it comes to internal auditors. The first point is, you have to detect the vulnerability, you have to detect the threat in your system, you have to know your attack vector. Now, being a mother, I know about my child more than anyone else, right? Someone else will be like, oh, such a sweet child. I only know what that sweet child do. So you can get ISA certification, you can get hundreds of certifications and put it in your website, but the internal auditors know very well where are you lacking? What is wrong in your system, right? I, I don't know if I can say, but we can trick sometimes also. Right? But you know the truth. And it's, that's very important that you bring that up and tell the management that here is somewhere we are lacking and we would have to make it strong. That is very important and that's an important role which is there in your shoulders, I feel. Second is point out and evaluate the risk and efficiency of control. Now, uh, when you do an internal audit, a lot of people will say, yeah, what, what is the risk? Okay, I have this control. What is the big deal? But how much is that control actually mitigating the risk is very important, right? So you were saying, I have awareness session, I'm taking awareness session. How much is the reachability of the awareness session? How much the people are understanding what you're talking? Now that's important. Just taking a checklist is not something that would work. That's not why we are here as an internal auditor, right? It's important that we check, we are, we are going beyond checklist and we are going beyond all these things and making sure that the things which, the control which is in place is actually efficient. Right, the third point, help in developing adequate strategy, policies, programs, along with the uh, board of directors and senior managers. Now, ransomware is not any more a tap topic which is just spoken in these kind of forums or with the senior managers, that's it. It is something that the board of directors also are very much interested because the business will be at stake if one attack happens, right? Just one attack, your data is getting leaked, you are gone, you're not going to be in business tomorrow, no one will trust you. So it's something that has to reach the top, uh, top level and it is your responsibility to ensure that it's going to the top level. And they will not understand if you go and, if I and you, I mean, I go and talk about this, they will not understand because I'll talk to technical language, right? But being an auditor, you will talk from the risk perspective. It'll be easy for you to point it out and tell them what could go wrong. So that is an, another thing that you have to be very, very, uh, you know, be on point about that. The next would be independently act in surveillance, right? So there is a lot of tabletop exercises that happens in the company. You do simulations, you check how things work, or you call everyone who's a, a business, you know, a disaster recovery um, member, or you call the BCP member, you tell them this is the procedure, bhai, dekhlo, this is what is written. Okay, bye-bye. No, that's not how it works. You have to ensure they understand. You, they understand what is their role. Who will act when? What will they do? So, if, if they are not aware of that, Things will not work. I'm a big, uh, big uh, follower of the shared responsibility model. In my past 10, uh, you know, one decade of my job, this is something I really like, shared responsibility model. Information security is not the responsibility of one person or one team. It's the responsibility of everyone. You cannot say, that's not my job, boss. You know, someone else is going to take care of that. No, you can't say that, right? If you are picking on a phishing link, you are going to get sacked tomorrow. <laughs> they will ask you, man. Yo, I gave you security awareness session and you did not, wh what were you doing during that session? Why were you negligent enough to click on this link? So we have to be very, very careful about that. And you have to act in surveillance to check how things are working or how things are not working. And the last point, monitor and continual improvement. 
Now, at this point, you have an internal audit report which says, perfect, all the controls are working 100%, we are ready for ransomware attack tomorrow, nothing will go wrong. But the attack surface is changing. Tomorrow, sophisticated uh, methodology will come. Are you ready tomorrow? Are you monitoring your system? That is also very important, and that's important that you ask these people when you're auditing. Right, and you being the third line of defense, you know, I think I, I read it in a Deloitte a paper only that, you know, uh, internal auditors are called the third line of defense, and I like that line, third line of defense. So, we being the third line of defense, we have a lot of responsibility in our shoulders. Moving the 10 smart habits, all right. Now, I'm going to talk about, now, this is just not 10 things. You don't tell me that I did all these 10 things and still I, I got ransomware attack, Devika. I, you know, what did, what did you blabber? No. <laughs> this is just the top 10 points I'm going to talk about, all right, which you really have to uh, think about. The first is keep devices, browsers, and software up to date. Right, because today a vulnerability is there, tomorrow it, it will not there, it will evolve. So it's important that you are up to date and your system, your security system is up to date. That is very important. Second, backing up is your best bet. Backup is really important in every situation, especially in cyber attacks and ransomware attacks, backups can help you a lot. So ensure your backups are happening properly and it is safe. You can retrieve the backup. I have a backup, but I cannot retrieve data from backup. What are you gonna do with that backup? Waste of time, right? So you have to ensure that it is retrievable also. The, f the third is handle password carefully and authenticate. Now, if there is no proper access control, no authentication mechanism in place, whatever you do, anybody could access your system and things can go wrong. So you have to ensure that you're handling passwords very carefully. The fourth is practice network segmentation and identify exposed assets. Now, if you don't know what assets you have, how will you protect it? You need to have a proper asset inventory. You need to know what is the asset that you want to protect. Okay? And similarly, network segmentation. What is network segmentation? Can someone tell me what is network segmentation? Okay, I'll... Right, sir, absolutely. So having different, uh, uh, you know, kind of assets in different networks could be called network seg segmentation. For example, our Wi-Fi network here, okay, will not be in the same network where the data of this Crown, um, Crown Plaza, right, I, I forgot the name, is there, right? It'll be, it'll not be same. So if I'm having access to the Wi-Fi network, okay, I'm a hacker, and I have access to the network directly, I can just go and do a hacking and get the details. So you have to segregate the network, keep important data somewhere else, non-important data somewhere else, and then give access to important data only to people who should have access to it. Right. <laughs> Moving on, yeah. So. It is not very good to use. In fact, if you see, I've seen Deloitte. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've seen Deloitte people coming for audit and they never use our uh, network. They say, I don't want to connect to your network. I have a Airtel, uh, what is it, dongle given by my company and I'll be using that, right? Because they don't want the data to be in the other network. In case my network is vulnerable, something could go wrong and their data may get exposed. Similarly, segregation means like if a, if a uh, guest is coming, why do you want a guest to have access to your network? That's what I'm talking about, network segregation. And I hope, yeah. Also to use VPN, no? Yes, VPN is very important. Wherever customer data is involved, VPN is very, very important. So that is the seventh point. Uh, I'll talk about that in the seventh point. The uh, fifth one is to prepare and practice your plan. If you say, I have a plan, but is that plan going to work when there is an emergency? You have to test it. You do a fire drill in the company. That's very normal that we see, right? Fire drill are done because to make people understand what are you supposed to do if tomorrow a fire 
actual fire incident happens. Similarly, BCP tabletop exercise, uh, DR recovery exercises, all these things are done to check whether whatever I'm expecting to happen when a disaster happens, will I be able to do those steps during that time or not? So that is how prepare and practice your plan. All right. Next is monitor IAM permission and misconfiguration. IAM permission. Now, everyone in the company will not be having the same kind of permissions. Right? As an employee, I'll, having, I'll have a different kind of permission in the system. IT department will have a different kind of permission in the system. Uh, you know, in a lo lot of companies, they are not giving permission to the people to install any software in the system. Right? That is what permissions, uh, you know, segregation of permissions, basically, you can say. Next is implement detective controls like IDS, IPS, DLP, zero trust, and VPN. That's why whenever, it's, it's the main thing in the checklist, right? When you go for an ISO attack, uh, ISO audit, VPN hai, VPN irka, right? You see that. So that's very, very basic. It has to be there in place. The next is delete when no longer required. Now here I'm touching the privacy aspect. Can you mention yeah. something in the zero trust process? Like, um, Zero Trust, there is a lot of uh, applications available, like there's something called Cososis from by Prisma, there is like, um, you know, CrowdStrike, EDR, there are a lot of uh, devices available, which will be like, you know, it has uh, systems in place where it can detect very easily. And there are combination of IDS, IPS and Zero Trust in one single software also. A lot of things are there. So if today a vulnerability is coming into picture, it will update the same date, day. You can, yeah, those kind of things it'll do. The next is about delete when no longer required. Now, you know, I have seen in my house, uh, they have a habit of holding a lot of things, thinking that I may require it tomorrow. My parents, my in-laws have this habit, yaar. Yeah, why should I throw it, yaar? Someday I will need it, let me keep it in the loft. Right? We have that habit. I don't know. I don't like it, but I've seen my parents, my in-laws having that habit. Similarly, companies also have this habit of having a data even after they don't need it after that. They'll be like, someday I'll need this data. Let it be, na. What is the big deal? I have a big server. Let, let that sit there. Right? But tomorrow if an attack happens, unnecessary data can get exposed. And then they will ask you a question, why are you having my data today when you don't need it? I gave it to you 10 years before and you're having the data till now. That is why regulation is also coming up with data retentions, policies. You know, you should delete this data after these many days. Background verification data should also be deleted after seven years, I think, right, sir? I don't, I don't remember. So there are criteria there. You have to ensure that is taken into practice. The next is have a good vulnerability management program. Vulnerability is there, going to be there in the system every day. You cannot do anything about it. But what is your plan to manage the vulnerability? How are you going to ensure that vulnerabilities get fixed? No, today 10 vulnerabilities come. You cannot be solving all the vulnerabilities or fixing all the vulnerabilities the same day, right? But you can prioritize them and according to the priority, you can fix up those vulnerabilities. Right. So you see here, I said 10 smart habits, but I only have nine. Now, there are a lot of things, but what do you think is the major habit that I left or I missed? Training. Absolutely. Training. That's my favorite. Absolutely. Awareness is the key and good security standard depends on 90-10 rule. That is 10% of technical controls and 90% of the controls rely on the people, you and me. Right? So, you have control over the technical aspects, but really you don't have control over the 90%. You cannot, I, you cannot judge anyone, right? How will I react to an email? I may be talking about these here, but tomorrow if I get a sophisticated phishing attack, I don't know if I'll click on that or not. Right? That depends on what situation I am in at that time. So, that is very, very important. And if you're not giving awareness to, if you don't have proper awareness sessions in your company, it's going to hit you hard. Tell me. I never knew, they'll say. How do I know? Mujhe kya pata? Yene ke na teriyo, right? That kind of a thing they'll say, and then you cannot say anything. Yeah, yeah. You cannot say anything about that. All right. I think we, we are short of time. So how to survive a ransomware attack? Now, I have everything, Devika. I have preparation in place, but still I got hit by a ransomware attack. Now, what do I do? Okay, the first is disrupt and stop the adversaries. 
you will the infosec team will know what needs to be done you have to isolate the system you have to isolate the network and ensure that that's not ex uh, spreading across the whole network second is to understand your adversary how did the adversary come into your system if you understand based on that only you can think about what to do next so it's important that you understand your adversary. Next is to remove the adversary's presence, right? Remove them from the system at all. Cut the access through which they came in. Next would be to recover from attack and avoid recompromise. Now, if you have recovered from the attack and you're not working on recompromise, trust me, tomorrow after one year also they can come. They have a backdoor in the system. They can come tomorrow and again try to do something in your system. Or they're watching what's going on in the system and they can come back. So you have to ensure their presence is fully cut and you're recovering and, and you're ready, you're not ready for a compromise, I would say. That's what you have to ensure. The next would be post-incident activity and lessons learned. Now lessons learned, learn from the history. We say history repeats, but here we don't want the history to be repeated. We have to be very, very careful about that, right? What are we learning? You should not, I've heard somewhere that you should not leave a good crisis go waste. Right? You have to learn how you did good or bad in a crisis and what you should do if a similar thing happens tomorrow. And you should not wait for a ransomware attack to happen in your company and learn. You should learn from somewhere, someone else getting hit by a ransomware attack and ensure that's not going on in your company. Okay. Now this is the major thing, all right? A case study. I'm not going to put up any uh, famous case study about any company, but this is also a true one, trust me. But Let's discuss about that. So there was a food and beverage company that, hand, that got a ransomware attack and how they handled is what we are going to discuss. So what happened here is an employee got a phishing email, okay? A normal employee. In a food and beverages, it's very, very common to people to get invoices and things like that, right? So this person got a phishing email, which was an MS word and it was labeled as invoice. So he thought, okay, it's an invoice. He clicked on that. He did not check which domain it is coming from, which email it is coming from, is it a client? He did not check that, he just downloaded that. Once he downloaded, what happened? PowerShell command, which is a very powerful uh, command execution, that command execution happened. If this get executed, they can do admin level changes in the system. Okay, and this person, what he did is, he just downloaded a emotent payload, which is, a uh, uh, you know, something related to financials, basically, related payload, and that can help in bringing other malware in the system. Sophisticated malware it is. That happened, and that helped in delivering TrickBot. TrickBot uh, can compromise the backdoors and your networks. It's another sophisticated, uh, you know, malware. And then Ruink ransomware, which is like a basic ransomware, Ruink, it's the name of it, got de deployed in the system and then they asked for ransomware. So as I said in the first slide, it's not that easy. Ki encryption is happening and that's it. There is multiple layers or multiple layer of attack surfaces that which, is, which has been used. Multiple kind of attacks that has been used. PowerShell command is a command that can be only used by admins of a company, like IT people. So like it could be used for uh, installing some kind of softwares or th things like that. So this person, when the phishing attack happened, the malicious code executed a PowerShell uh, command, basically. And they, that basically downloaded an emotent karke, uh, uh, you know, a malware. And that emotent, it bought another malware, which is called TrickBot. So now there's two malware. <coughs> Three malwares, ransomware is also a malware. One, see, the thing is, this PowerShell execution was easy for them to uh, get in emotent payload. Every malware cannot be executed as easily. So, ek, you know, it will bring up another thing, another thing. It happens in layers. So, the moment you get admin access, that is meant to watch which of the firewalls or things to go through. That can also be done and to execute. For example, in a lot of companies, a normal person will not have access to install anything in the system, right? Now, this is a uh, program installation, a malicious code, code in installation that's happening in the system. Normal people will not have access to install anything. They will say you don't have permission. No, but even when we do payments, we have checked the I value as six eyes. Now, I'm saying such an important functionality of PowerShell can only be done by one person in an admin mode. You have there could be a lot of people, a lot of people. But here, that, uh, that control was not there in that company. Ha, right now it is disabled. Mostly so it's not there. Yeah, 
you know in my company i we, everyone cannot send attachments to outside domain i cannot send it, and i have permission because there's a business reason because of which i have permission but most of the people will not have access to send any attachments from the company it's for data leakage you cannot leak up anything from here unnecessarily and even if i am sending an attachment i have permission it is monitored everything is monitored all right so is it clear this attack okay now we're going to talk about what went good in this attack and what went bad all right so there were few things that this company did the first thing is they did not pay ransom because okay, they said i am not going to pay you and what they did second is they brought in a security expert very early so that the person was able to isolate and cut down that system and ensure that the whole system is not getting compromised and the third thing they did is this was done within 48 hours of the business attack lot of companies i think there was one big company i think it was mark i don't remember the name but it was not in business a manufacturing company was not in business for like one month because of a ransomware attack they said you pay me the money they were like i will not pay you and they did not let them do business for a month so it could be very very fatal right and what could have been better now i would not say what went bad but what could have been better the first thing is awareness to handle phishing attack right that could have been given to the employee that person could have detected better that is this a mail coming from a genuine uh, mail id or not second thing patching of vulnerabilities there were vulnerability in the system because of which ek ke baad ek ek ke baad ek they were able to put up malwares that could have been prevented the third point powershell could have been disabled for admin as you rightly said nowadays most of the companies don't have powershell right uh, strong passwords and mfa because lot of network created uh, you know uh, spreading was happening it was because there was no proper access control and uh, mfa is in place and then default passwords and end of life machines were used in that company that was also another reason why this was very very problematic ransomware attack all right any questions around this now this is almost the second last slide no question but i'm just thinking ha huh. privileged access management is a very important thing which is not there in lot of companies in fact it's not there you will think it's basic and it should be there but it is it is not there in lot of companies because fam yeah absolutely absolutely it's it's important that you have the basics right i've heard my ceo saying have the basics right don't think too much don't use your brain too much first have the basics right yeah. that's very very important and a lot of times we think so much sophisticated but we don't get the basics right yeah we just have two minutes more because we have to so i also have just one question for you all now give me an answer for it guys will you pay a ransom if you are a victim of a cyber attack and you are in a position to decide whether a ransom has to be paid or not yes sir cost of the data absolutely you are a company who is in healthcare sector you are handling phi right you have to think whether i can forego this much data or not it really depends on lot of things of course it is good that you're not paying a ransom but it's not that easy you really have to take a decision at that time it's not illegal to not to pay ransom where a ransom but will you pay it or not depends on how big the company is how big the data is lot of things so but you know personal data you know it's my uh, perception i feel that in india still we don't we don't care th that much about personal data we don't mind 
we don't mind right but that's a That's a business actually, right? They collect a lot of data and they sell it for money. That is a business that's happening. There is no control over that. Now when data protection bill comes into picture, maybe that will be there, right? So that's it guys, any questions for me? Well, we had a lot of questions during the uh, session itself, which just meant how brilliant it is. Uh, please give a big round of applause to her. Thank you so much. Fantastic, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm sure a lot of people missed it. So I would highly recommend them to listen to the recorded videos which should very soon get onto YouTube as well. Uh, so many important things, morality, curiosity, conformity, stimulation, investigation. My God, you have actually made us a lot curious. Just feel how <laughs> insecure world we are in, right? I mean, life before was so much more simpler. And, uh, but clearly, I think... Uh, we have to be a lot more vigilant uh, and aware to be a lot more safer. And I'm actually quite concerned when I see my parents or that generation who is very, very vulnerable. You know, we have to constantly keep telling them, ye mat karo wo, mat karo, but out of No, absolutely. My mother-in-law, she asked me, Devi, I'm getting a message. If I forward this much message, <laughs> I will get this much money. I was like, please don't do that. What do you want? I'll buy you. Don't do that. Yeah. Out of innocence, we have made them oh, so absolutely. much fearful of everything to look at. Uh, we have made everyone auditors to be a bit more suspecting. Brilliant. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to break for lunch. Now. Thank you. Thank you so much.